Um, I'm really delighted uh, that uh, he is joining us uh, this evening. I mean, Dorian is going to be speaking for about 45 minutes um, and taking questions afterwards, which will, he will uh, manage. Um, Dorian has just published a book on the subject of this evening's talk. And I hold this up on my iPad. I hope you can see it all. So this is about Victoria Tower Gardens and um, just in time for Christmas, you can yeah. uh, take advantage of this splendid publication with great historical references, maps and so on through the web Thorny Island website for £15, including postage and package. Um, it's a marvellous study. Absolutely marvellous. Um, thank you, Dorian, for making that available just now as we are at the last week of the public inquiry. Uh, Dorian was um, a House of Commons clerk for 33 years, um, but he's speaking to us uh, now as a historian who started writing about his local area, Putney, which is where he lives, and more recently amongst a wide variety of subjects on Westminster Hall, and London Bridge and its houses, which is a marvellous, marvellous work. I mean, he's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a member of the Council of the London Topographical Society, amongst many others. So he's going to talk to us now about Victoria Tower Gardens, uh, which was reclaimed from the Thames in the medieval period. So over to you, Dorian, to bring us up to date over this somewhat several hundred Yes. Thank you. Now, now let's hope that the technology is going to work for us. There is a time lag between, there we go, it's appeared, between me changing the slides and you seeing them. But I also have it set up on a laptop next to me. So if it looks like you haven't got my full attention. It's because I'm looking at the laptop to see if you're seeing what I'm seeing. Um, which hopefully you will. Uh, the title slide is Wenceslas Holler's print of Westminster in about 16, well, not his print, sorry, his drawing of Westminster in about 1647. And you will see later um, his print, which covers a somewhat larger area. Can you hear me all right, as well as see the slides? Any problems? Yes. Yes, Someone fine. will shout, I'm sure. Thank you. Good. So I'm going to talk about how the site developed and talk about the history of the park, which we know as Victoria Tower Gardens, coming almost up to the present until the point at which I would topple into controversial matters. Now, what we're talking about, um, it'll appear on your screens in a moment, I think. Uh, if we can get the slide to change. Whoops. Um, uh, right. Um, it's not why you're seeing a somewhat random collection of slides because somehow it went forward six and now it's come back. Hopefully that's the last technical problem we'll have. Um, it's not simple, um, the area we're talking about, because obviously the area has changed a lot um, over the past few hundred years. That's the 1949-50 Ordnance Survey map, which I use because it's out of copyright, but it's also black and white and a bit simpler. Um, Obviously, it doesn't, it's not the same as today. There's a mysterious building near the Palace of Westminster, which I suspect is to do with the rebuilding. Um, and some of the modern features aren't there. But you can see the green line shows Victoria Tower Gardens. I've ignored the Parliamentary Education Centre. The thick red line shows the three areas of wharves and houses that were purchased by the Crown or by London County Council in the 19th century. Um, the thin red lines you needn't worry about at the moment. So in 1837, um, the government bought back what had been the southern part of the old Palace of Westminster, which James I had sold in the 17th century. Um, it includes the northern bit of what's now Black Rod's Garden. Um, you can see the three there marking it. Um, and I'm not going to say much about it tonight because it's not Victoria's Tower Gardens. The second middle section is the land purchased in 1867 
which became the first part of Victoria Tower Gardens after a bit of a delay. And then the next part, the southern part, marked as number 10, uh, was bought by the London County Council between the Act of 1900 and the opening of the later part of Victoria Tower Gardens in 1914. They wanted to widen Millbank um, and also to create an open space next to the river. And they embanked, in fact, at each point, uh, they embanked an extra bit of land. So what I should really have called the talk, and in fact it's been referred to it a moment ago, is from mud and slime to public park because it's all made ground. So you can see there between the red line and the green line by the river uh, what was embanked in the 1870s and 1900s. But the rest of it also um, is reclaimed land all the way to the Abbey Wall uh, at the um, west side of um, so that's gone out of my uh, college green, that's it. Uh, now I think we, I can draw on it. Uh, let's, um, so, whoops, that should be a straight line. Um, and you should now see on your screen, it's just appearing. I don't think it has appeared, but anyway, next to the number 11 to the left, um, the Abbey Wall originally marked the, um, where the land ended and the river began. Uh, that was also the edge of the Palace of Westminster. The northern part of the Palace of Westminster is the part that's well known, the, called the Great Palace, uh, with the finest buildings of which, of course, we still have Westminster Hall. The southern part was the more domestic part known as the Privy Palace, um, with where it's marked B, um, was the, um, what they call the Queen's Bridge or Parliament Stairs, um, which was the southern entry point and also the entry to the House of Lords. It's probably where the gunpowder barrels came in in 1605. And south of that were only some buildings built by Edward III, a new chapel and chamber, and of course the jewel tower, which is marked there as D. But the Privy Palace has been not very well known, and even the extent of the precinct has been unknown to the south of the palace. Um, but things began to become clearer. Uh, Trying to get the slide to change. Oops. Uh, there we are. Um, clearly, I should have got rid of those two um, marks I've put on it, which um, are now going to stay there, it seems. This is the excavation of 1963 on College Green. I've turned the map round so you have north at the top and it's a bit more comprehensible. You have there the jewel tower and the moat, which you all know about. The uh, vertical line at the bottom is the Abbey's wall, still there by College Green. The black wall parallel to the moat, which I've marked as wall, was what was dug up in 1963 and was an early 13th century wall, probably from the minority of Henry III in around about 1210. But south of it, there was evidence of the Thames lapping against that wall. So the wall of the palace faced south onto the river um, with the Thames where College Green is now. And we can see that on the aerial photos. Uh, not that one. Uh, there we are. Um, I've marked, you can just see it by Victoria Tower at the top, the Abbey Wall and the Wall of Henry III. They're facing south onto College Green. Uh, just wondering if I can get rid of these blobs which I've put on it, but. Um, you might have to put up with them for the rest of the talk if I can't get rid of them. Um, there we are. Um, 
Now, south, we've, we've had that. So the plans and reconstructions of the palace generally show the same situation continuing up to the 16th century. But in 2015, which you'll see in a moment, excavations in Black Rod's garden found the palace's river wall. Uh, there it is. Um, it's not those round things, it's behind them, a set of stone blocks. And they can't be earlier than about the early 14th century because they're of Kentish ragstone, um, which only then began to be used. And they can't be later than 1463 because we know then there was already a garden next to the abbot's mill. So they've reclaimed land south of the old wall of Henry III. And I've marked it there uh, with the line of the Abbey Wall, the Southern Wall, and a wall going through Victoria Tower Gardens and coming back towards the Victoria Tower. So that is the land reclaimed and used as the Palace Garden, most likely around 1342 when Edward III built on the existing garden and therefore he needed some new ones. And in a moment, um, the Ordnance Survey map will appear and will show you exactly where this is in relation to Victoria Tower Gardens again. I promise it will in a moment. Um, there it is. And I've marked on the map, because it wasn't there, they weren't there in 1950, the Burgers of Calais in their present position as a red blob, and further south is the Buxton Memorial as the other red blob. So it's just the north west corner of Victoria Tower Gardens was part of the, the palace. The main royal palace was burnt in 1512 and that's when uh, the, um, the king moved out. This is a drawing of about 1532. We know that because they've got rid of the cupola on top of Westminster Abbey but they haven't yet demolished the Privy Palace which evidently survived um, after the fire, but nevertheless the king had moved out. Probably it was too old-fashioned. And this is the only drawing we have of it. Uh, in a moment you'll see a, an enlargement of the part that's of most interest to us, um, with the abbey, there we are, the abbey is in the number one in the top right hand corner, something called the Great Tower is number two, three is Parliament Stairs, four is the new buildings of Edward III in about 1342, five is the Jewel Tower, which of course we still know, and six is the exit from the Abbey Drain into the Thames through the palace's river wall. The by the time we first have a map of the area, um, and in a moment you'll see Brown and Hogan, Hogenberg's map surveyed in about 1557 and published later, the Privy Palace has been cleared. Its stones have been used to build Whitehall. Um, all that's left is the river wall. Um, there we are. Now, I better not put any more marks on the... Um, using zoom because I haven't worked out how to remove them later. So you see there it says in the middle the Queen's Bridge and to the left of that is what seems to be a surviving bit of Henry III's wall. Uh, further south where you see the corner tower of the Abbey Precinct there's a little bit of wall there um, which seems to me to be the southern part of the um, palace's garden walls surviving, but nothing else is left. And then beyond that, and you'll see it later, the slaughterhouse and the mill dam or mill ditch, as they called it. But the next plan um, is a slightly peculiar plan. Um, and I put it on the left, the right way up, 
and the wonder of PowerPoint is that I also show it to you the wrong way up, so you have north at the top. So if you concentrate on the map on the right hand side, you'll know where you are because you can see the Thames on the right um, towards the left is Old Palace Yard. And just to the left of the number 22, upside down, is the old um, palace wall. Um, it's an unusual map. The Crown didn't usually do maps, um, rather to its disadvantage. But there was clearly a dispute in the 1660s over the moat of the jewel tower. And so someone had the idea of trying to put together a map to work out what the Crown still owned and what it had sold. And the poor old surveyor just had written descriptions from uh, 1611 and 1614, but the whole landscape had changed. And also the lawyers had revised the descriptions, which I'm afraid he didn't realize. So it's full of mistakes, although it did give the right answer to the Crown that they did own the jewel tower moat. Um, it's also not to scale, uh, but it is very useful. It shows the river wall. Um, you can also see um, towards the left, B is the jewel tower. Towards the bottom, A is the slaughterhouse. It shows uh, round uh, numbers 14 to 21. Land has been let out as small gardens, about 25 feet wide, with little garden houses there. And there, uh, either side of an alley called Spade Alley, uh, just above them, if you read the number 12 upside down, is what they called the way to the wood wharf, which was later Little Abingdon Street. And that gives us a fix on the current uh, landscape because where it comes into Abingdon Street, which you see on the left, uh, immediately north of it on the corner is the um, little stone shelter, which you can still see um, at the Abingdon Street end of Blackrod's Garden. It's not until the 1580s that the Crown begins to develop this land, mostly by selling it or leasing it out. Um, the other thing this map shows is the ex where the palace ended. That's how we know that the palace grounds ended at Great College Street and uh, roughly along the same line heading towards the slaughterhouse. Um, in 1540, the Crown acquired the remaining land all the way down to um, the Horse Ferry where Lambeth Bridge is now. Um, they briefly gave it back to Westminster Abbey in 1542 and then the Abbey surrendered it again in 1546. But despite owning the whole area from the palace to the Horse Ferry, the Crown didn't treat it as a single estate. Um, it sold all of it except the slaughterhouse um, within a short space of time between 1597 and 1614. The earliest development, so in a moment you'll see John Norden's map of central Westminster. There we are. Um, so uh, towards the right hand side you've got King's, it says it's the King's Bridge, the main entrance to Old Palace, New Palace Yard, then further left is Old Palace Yard, uh, towards the um, south you get to Queen's Slaughterhouse and the Mill and then Millbank. Um, so the part that I've edged in red there, that was the first area to be developed. It was land between the River Wall and the Thames, probably marsh originally. It was let in 1585 to John Daw, a labourer, uh, all the way from the a sluice north of Parliament stairs to the slaughterhouse. So it just um, edges into Victoria Tower Gardens, as you can see on the right. And it was later said that John Daw did with so much cost in winning the same out of the River of Thames and making the same firm and fit for building of map. houses thereupon. Uh, and it was then built up with houses and timber wharves. Um, the next slide will look like um, rather a lot of maps together on one slide. Uh, but the top one will be a map of two parts of this area in 1696. Um, and below it, so there you have them, um, 
below it is the main one to look at where I've turned round um, part of it so you have north at the top and there you can see on the left where it is in relation to Victoria Tower Gardens today. So heavily developed with houses and wharves. And there you can see the two roads, Spade Alley and what became Little Abingdon Street. Um, so even by the mid 17th century, there were 18 houses here. The funny little blue things on the map are doorways. And this was later rebuilt as two wharves around about 1720, the houses were cleared, it becomes more industrial. The next bit of land is the uh, southeast corner of the old Royal Garden. So that's um, around where Mrs. Pankhurst is now in the northwest part of Victoria Tower Gardens, which became a row of houses. They're rebuilt in 1720. So there you have it on the left-hand side. On the right, um, that's the houses which you can see the south end of just underneath um, Victoria Tower there. And you'll see that picture again later. Then south of that is the Slaughterhouse, which is a rather mysterious building. Uh, it first appears on maps as the Queen's Slaughterhouse under Elizabeth, but royal palaces didn't have slaughterhouses and Westminster Abbey certainly did have one because um, it's got a lot of estates locally. And it, I think it's probably built in the early 16th century. Um, it will appear in the end. Um, sometime after the palace ceased to be occupied by the king and before the land passed to the to the crown. Um, certainly it was in royal hands by 1546. Seems very reluctant to appear on your screens. Um, I assume it will appear in the end. Um, that's, uh, I assume you, oh, that's it. So on the map on the right, you can see where it was. It's just uh, northwest of the Burgers of Calais. To the left are the two views of it. Um, rather remarkably, there's no artistic license, one can tell. They actually seem to show the same building a century apart, which is always helpful. Um, it's basically a room about 65 by 30 feet below and some rooms above. And the crown, that's the one area, bit of the area that the crown keeps and it carries on using it for the same purpose, though why it needed a slaughterhouse isn't clear. But by the 18th century, it's become a timber wharf and is rebuilt. Then the next building was the Abbey's water mill, first mentioned in 1281, not necessarily on the same site as later, but certainly in the Millbank area. All the evidence we have for it is relatively late, around the time when it disappeared. On the map of um, 1682, actually surveyed in 1674, which you can now see, you can see it's uh, the mill ditch. The mill itself is at the end of what's now Great College Street. I've marked it with an X. And the mill ditch is a sort of ring shape um, it goes along Great College Street. Originally, it went on along Orchard Street, um, which is no longer uh, there in the same way because of the building of um, Victoria Street. It then goes along Str Strutton Ground, Horseferry Road, and back along Millbank. So it's a circular structure, and it means they can store water to power the mill. Evidently, it, it changes over time as um, the river, the level of the Thames rises uh, and changes are made by the Abbey to the course of the Tyburn, which probably originally emerged into the river at Pimlico. Um, they then, then built an artificial course to flush the Abbey drains and then eventually in the 1370s or thereabouts diverted around the Abbey's walled area uh, uh, to power the mill, among other things. 
here's the other part of the 1696 map. So on the uh, plan on the left of the Ordnance Survey map, the mill itself is the pink bit. So over where the uh, Burgers of Calais are. Um, in 1604, it's close, just south of it, which is the lilac area was separated from it and that became heavily built up and that's what you can see on the right. Um, again, with the most heavily built up facing Millbank itself, uh, wharves and a lime wharf by the river and south of it is a, a drain um, and a lane. The drain incidentally has figured in the current planning inquiry. Then all the land to the south of that, all the way to the Horse Ferry, uh, originally belonged to Westminster Abbey. It then passes to the Crown in, under Henry VIII. It's held by royal servants, especially for some reason the King's laundresses until um, late in the 16th century. It then has a series of gentry or noble owners and is developed in about 1615 by a man rejoicing in the name of Zidrak Bryce, who was a Westminster carpenter. Um, you can see it marked on the plan there. It also had a brewery by 1622 and the brewer later complained that he'd been prosecuted by Charles I Attorney General because he burnt so much coal at his brewery that it annoyed the king at Whitehall Palace. By 1651, it has 33 houses, two breweries, a distilling house, and three timber yards on it. So by about 1620, the whole riverside is well developed. Um, you can see it in Holler's view from Lambeth in about 1647. You've got wharves, slaughterhouses, mill plot, long osier plot, and so on. Uh, there it is. Uh, so it built up. On, so the bottom takes you from Westminster Abbey about as far as the old or beyond the old mill. The upper one continues it all the way to the horse ferry. And an interesting detail which will be picked out in a moment is a banqueting house which in 1651 is recorded that one of the houses has an arbor and walk lying behind the same extending to the Thames with a banqueting house at the end thereof standing several steps in ascent, very pleasant and affordeth a delightful prospect. The area then becomes increasingly industrial. On Roke's map, you can see two breweries, five timber wharves, three stone wharves, a brick wharf, a coal wharf, a dung wharf, a bricklayer's yard, and an engine maker's premises. Naturally, you think engine makers and you think of steam engines, but what he actually made was fire engines and pumping engines uh, powered by wind, water, horses, or men. He was John Gray, Jr. And he's there from 1725 right up to 1757. Then he gives demonstrations at Millbank of how high he can project the water using his engines. There are important stone wharves as well. And this was one of the main areas where building materials were landed for the construction of Westminster and the West End. Um, for example, the Tufnell family and Thomas Gayfair, who were master masons to Westminster Abbey, and earlier Samuel Tufnell and Andrews Jelf, who were the two men who built Westminster Bridge. And there is Westminster Bridge in Canaletto's painting of about 1750 from the gatehouse of Lambeth Palace. He's showing you there not just the bridge, but the abbey and all the way along to St John Smith Square. This being Canaletto, he gives you far more than you would think. So here are two enlargements. Uh, from roughly Westminster Hall, almost to St John Smith Square. On the top one, A is Parliament Stairs, two is a timber yard, three is a stone yard, and you can see the stone stacked up there. Seven is the former slaughterhouse with a rather fine house of about 1740. Number nine is Timber Wharf. Next to that is B, 
um, which is a brewery. And for the sake of completeness, the last bit, which will appear in a moment, um, D is John Gray's Engine Works, and then E is a second brewery. In due course, there we are. Uh, so D is the Engine Works and E brewery. And I just put the um, uh, old slaughterhouse site on just to show, and it may be even clearer in the original painting, just the incredible detail here. You can see the the planks stacked up against the side. Um, up towards the left, there's a little um, sort of hut on, on posts, which is probably a counting house from which you could um, oversee a wharf. By, from 1837, the wharves start to disappear. The first I've mentioned is the 1837 Act. And I will put on one picture of that area because it's rather remarkable. It's um, Shaft's view of 1851 and the Palace of Westminster is still under construction. You've got um, part of the Victoria Tower, you've got the um, new building at the end of Westminster Hall. On the right you've got the Chequers Pub and Little Abingdon Street just next to it. But most remarkably left of the Victoria Tower you've got, still got two houses not yet demolished from Abingdon Street, which used to extend much further north. But still you've got the rest of the wharves, and there's one of the most remarkable pictures ever taken of the Palace of Westminster um, from 1865 by William Strudwick, and you can see the wharves go right up to the palace, and you can zoom in on them. So the very tall building Next to the chimney is a flour mill. To its right, there's a white colored building, which is a cement works. Further on, there's an oil factory and then other wharves. I'll just show a few other um, pictures from this period. Uh, the first is a uh, watercolor showing Vine Wharf. Uh, which is the large building to the left in 1898, occupied by corn merchants. And by this time, you've got the first bit of Victoria Tower Gardens you can see in the distance jutting out. And then the next one is a view of 1862, looking from south of Lambeth Bridge, north towards uh, uh, Millbank, uh, or the northern part of Millbank. And you can see Sidon uh, Vine Wharf and the Victoria Tower in the mist. Um, at the bottom is a view of 1907. It's certainly not very attractive anymore. Uh, there's still Vine Wharf. The chimney to the right is the London Hydraulic Power Company's chimney. They operated a system of high pressure water mains which powered machinery. Um, and you can see it's what it has facing Millbank on the right. Um, built in 1887. The system itself carries on until 1977, but no longer here. And then his next is a view looking along Millbank in about 1861. Uh, you saw a bit of it earlier. Um, also giving you an idea of why the LCC wanted to widen and straighten Millbank. Uh, the road to the left in front of the uh, public house is Great Peter Street. But by this time, the new Palace of Westminster, having been built, is abutting directly onto wharves and houses. And the Lord Great Chamberlain is worrying in the 1860s about the fire risk. Um, there you can see how close they were. Um, they're talking about the wharves full of huge piles of straw, firewood, and timber. And worse than that, there's a stable loft with a door and window, which he says completely command the throne in the Queen's robing room. And any maniac or evil minded person secreted there might do incalculable mischief. And he persuades the Thames Embankment Commission that part of the wharf area should be purchased. And that's done under the Act of 1867. And they purchase it as far as Great Peter Street. But because they bought it for mainly because of the fire risk, they, there is no provision made in the act as to what they're going to do with it. And what is at first proposed is to turn the northern part 
into an open space. This is what you can see on the plan of 1875 on the left and build on the southern part. So you have a, a row of buildings there rather euphemistically called proposed new building to screen wharf behind. But W.H. Smith, who named obviously familiar to you as a newspaper seller, MP and First Lord of the Admiralty, broke the deadlock in 1879 by giving a thousand pounds towards, as he put it, laying out the ground for the use of the inhabitants and children especially of Westminster. And he added that he had a morbid desire to prevent open spaces being built on, um, as well he might. Um, Parliament added the remaining £1,400 and Smith extracted a promise from the Office of Works that the land would remain an open space. So what you see there on the right hand side is the Ordnance Survey map with the original design of 1875 just expanded a bit to fill the space. On the left is a proposal from 1912 when the gardens were about to be expanded. Um, showing a rejected idea to keep the northern bit as it was and just to lay out the southern part in a new way but instead they decided to um, replan the gardens as a whole um, but that means we do have this rather nice plan of the northern part of the garden with the trees individually marked. So the gardens were laid out or the north part in 1880-81 and opened in June 1881 and there's a photo when the gardens must still have been very new you can hardly see the plane trees at all and you can we well, obviously see the whole of the faca southern facade of the palace you can see the houses in Abingdon Street you can see the little stone shelter which is still there and then wharves on the left and of course it's all been embanked into the river they have a rather different idea of a park um, from ours. Uh, one of the rules, for example, is that no person may walk on the lawns. So it's, it's definitely a garden and not a recreational area. In addition, there to be no games, so it probably was not much use for children. Um, there it is um, with the original arrangement with a central shrubbery and the trees beginning to grow probably around 1910, that view. Um, no dogs were allowed either at first, or as they rather pompously put it, no dog is allowed to enter or to remain in these gardens. By 1904, uh, well-behaved dogs were allowed in. There were then various schemes for extending Victoria Tower Gardens, um, of which the one which was implemented was that of the London County Council in 1900. I might add they were also determined to demolish Smith Square and Lord North Street, um, which they were prevented from doing. Uh, they had two versions of their scheme. So at the top is the plan which they put forward in the Act. So they'd had a, a, an expensive version which had Millbank going more nearly along its present course and the cheap version which is what they put in where you took the road much closer to the river so you had a smaller open space and a larger area of building land but the House of Lords committee was influenced by the architect T.G. Jackson who thought that you should approach the palace from the south with the palace well in view so as you see in the Ordnance Survey map at the bottom they act instead took the line of Abingdon Street, extended it, and then gently um, diverted towards the river. The LCC plan involved taking part of Victoria Tower Gardens, which was protected by the agreement with WH Smith. And it's then that the first commissioner of works insisted that the act should provide that the new land between Millbank and the river become and remain an open space and also that land should be transferred to him from the LCC so that the old and new parts could be managed as a whole. And that's why the 1900 Act provided that the, that new land should be laid out and maintained as a garden open to the public and as an integral part of the existing Victoria Tower Garden. And Westminster Council gave £100,000 on the same basis. So they laid out the gardens as a whole in 1913-14 and there's an aerial view of 1928 
they've moved the circular shrubbery south, or at least they've recreated it further south, though some of the original trees you can see um, still there um, in the original northern part. You can also see they extended the lines of plane trees, and you can very clearly see the difference in ages there. Um, there are a few other trees, and there are some flower beds. Uh, right at the south end is the um, sand pit, which I'll talk about in a moment. And you see there to the original Lambeth Bridge and just to its uh, south, they're reclaiming a bit of the river, which is what is now Victoria Gardens South. Um, the next picture is looking from the south of the gardens, um, round about the same, in fact, slightly later, around about 1950, looking over the sand pit um, and towards the, the palace with the trees now having grown rather more. Uh, there it is. Um, there's what look like flower beds in the middle and the things that look like a row of teeth at the far end are deck chairs around the central shrubbery. And the next picture will show the central shrubbery with the statue of Mrs. Pankhurst, which I'll come on to. Around the same time, the gardens acquired their first memorial, which was Rodin's Burgers of Calais. Um, oh, there's Mrs. Pankhurst, who has now appeared. Um, and also you see the little um, railings bordering the paths to stop people walking on the lawns, still in 1950. Um, they were also there on the picture from about 1910. Uh, Rodin's statue was bought by the National Art Collections Fund and they needed somewhere to put it. Uh, they tried sending it to the Wallace Collection, um, which wouldn't have it. So in the end, it came to Victoria Tower Gardens. They also asked Rodin how they should display it, which turned out to be a big mistake um, because he wanted it on an enormous plinth, 16 feet high, uh, which you see there. And he wanted it right up against the Victoria Tower. Um, but they slightly moved it away without telling him. Um, but af ever afterwards, people complained about it. He, he really would have liked it to be in New Palace Yard, in fact. Um, there is more nonsense talked about this statue than about anything else in the planning inquiry, it has to be said. Now, we would think that a park is for children to play in, among other things, but that um, definitely was not the plan at first. And in 1918, the rather splendidly named Westminster Committee for Health, Temperance and Morality suggested there should be a children's playground at the South End, um, which was rejected because uh, undoubtedly they thought children would immediately start falling into the river from the river wall and also they'd need a custodian. And in 1921, the Metropolitan Public Gardens Association under Mr. Holmes tried again and a very grumpy note was written by the officials saying that Mr. Holmes ought to know, one would have thought, that to allow children to run about and play unorganized games on a small space will very speedily reduce what is now well-kept turf to an absolute waste. Now here, here is the most wonderful picture of industrious enjoyment in the sand pit at the south end of the gardens, which shows how the children did eventually get a look in. Though if you look a bit further on, it seems to me that um, the warning about the grass being wrecked may perhaps have been correct. Um, and it came about in a rather elliptical way in that in 1918, Henry Spicer of Old Queen Street, who was a paper merchant, offered £750 for a drinking fountain for the children. Incidentally, I've not managed to find any pictures of Henry Spicer, although his firm survived until recently. They asked Philip Tilden, who was later to be the architect of Chartwell, um, to design a wall with three fountains. Um, that's the wall that is routinely called the Spicer Memorial, but it was never meant to be a memorial at all. It's just a wall with fountains. Um, indeed also with animals by Miss Harris, about whom very little is known, but it's almost impossible to work out what the animals are anyway, in my experience. And it was Tilden who said it would be much better if you had both a fountain and a sand pit, and they got Spicer to agree to pay for both of them. And in 1923, when uh, the 
it's, there are other pictures, incidentally, of children in the um, sand pit, which I think were taken for, to show to Spicer himself. And I think they belong to Royal Parks, who can't currently get at them. But anyway, there are the little bruisers of SW1 proudly um, appearing before the camera. In 1923, the permanent secretary of the Office of Works, with a wonderful mixture of humanity and pomposity, says that masses of poor children who frequent the pit apparently obtain incessant and endless joy therefrom. And he described it as an overwhelming success and they very quickly had to double it in size. It was condemned as a health hazard in 1987 uh, with among other things the remark that the sand hadn't been changed for three years and you might think there was an obvious remedy for that which is to change the sand but anyway you, you can still see the outline of it in the current playground uh, that is the um, the plan of the sand pit um, very much uh, right up at the end of the gardens before they've created the entrance from the new Lambeth Bridge around about 1930. And you can see at its south end, then not the north end, the uh, sort of semicircular wall with the fountains, and at the other end are seats. Um, and a new sand pit was created in the changes around 2013 to 15, which is when they moved the Spicer wall. At this stage, the children were still not allowed on the grass and Noel Buxton, who was related to the Buxton of the memorial, um, managed to persuade the Office of Works in 1926 that you could let the children onto the lawn in August. And they did that experiment and the grass did in fact survive. And by 1933, they were letting the children on the southern lawn all the year and the central lawn during the summer holidays. Um, and they removed the flower beds as well because before that every time someone kicked a ball around the keepers would come and cuff them for interfering and endangering the flower beds. Around the same time the garden acquired its next monument, the statue of Emmeline Pankhurst commissioned after her death in 1928. The organiser of this was Catherine Marshall of 15 Gayfair Street, who had been part of the bodyguards unit trained in jiu-jitsu to protect fugitive suffragettes. They wanted to put it either in Downing Street or near the statue of Oliver Cromwell, but eventually agreed Victoria Tower Gardens. And the Office of Works clearly was gearing up for a campaign of delay because it was controversial, and it was a statue of a woman, which was very unusual then. Um, but the ground was cut from under them by Stanley Baldwin agreeing to unveil it. And he knew what he was doing because they'd already got Emmeline Pankhurst to agree to be a Conservative candidate before her death. Uh, they'd just given the vote to women on equal terms to men and there was an election imminent. And the statue was unveiled in 1930. And there's a splendid photo showing what a great event it must have been. And I think even in the distance in Abingdon Street, there's what looks like a banner. So the people have spread right outside the park. Also at this time, there's the new entrance at Lambeth Bridge. And in about 1949, the Houses of Parliament, not for the last time, take a bite out of Victoria Tower Gardens for a new boiler house. By 15, 19, sorry, 1952, there's dissatisfaction with the garden and they replan it with two aims. One is to improve the presentation of the burghers of Calais by getting rid of the ridiculous plinth. And the other is to increase the sense of space by freeing up the lawn and especially removing the central shrub shrubbery. And the aim, as one official put it, was to increase the broad leisurely parkland atmosphere of trees and grass. And this is what creates the gardens as we know them today. They had to resist various calls for flower beds, which was what they had been seeking to remove. So you kept the simplicity of it. And the problems they had were mainly over the statues. Having got rid of the great plinth of the burghers of Calais, they find that the, it's not really large enough to dominate the gardens at all. Um, so they, they plan to move it into the centre roughly where it is today, although it has moved slightly again. More problems over Mrs Pankhurst. They have meetings with the Suffragette Fellowship and they're not pleased. And there you see their 
angry telegram when it's um, raised with them. In fact, so angry they don't get the minister's name right. Um, and the minutes of the meeting show rather amusing the discomfort of pinstripe civil servants having most unusually to deal with some rather assertive women. And the minutes at one point says their mood grew more intransigent. Um, and there you see the uh, telegram that came afterwards. They didn't want it moved at all, but in the end, the suggestion was to put it where the burghers of Calais had been and indeed where it is now. Um, and that was agreed. And then very shortly afterwards, in 1959, the projecting wings were added, including one commemorating Christabel Pankhurst following her death. Uh, there are various noises going on, which are not me. Um, and then the other monument comes in at this time, and it's the Buxton Memorial, which had been erected in Parliament Square in 1865. There must be better pictures of it, but um, on the top left there, um, it's the only one I can find, which shows that it's towards the northwest of the square, outside the central um, roundabout. Um, there's a very peculiar man who seems to be frozen in the middle of the road there with his uh, briefcase and umbrella. At the bottom there is Buxton himself, Sir Thomas Fowell Buxton, who had succeeded Wilberforce in the anti-slavery campaign. When Parliament Square was reorganised in 1950, it was removed, but some parliamentary proceedings were necessary and the uh, an amendment was made which forced the government to agree to re-erect the Buxton Memorial uh, after it had been removed. Um, although Victorian architecture was not universally popular then, um, and the minister certainly didn't want it in Victoria Tower Gardens. Um, it was eventually put into the gardens where they had earlier proposed to put Emmeline Pankhurst. And I think the um, selection of site was inspired. Um, it's far enough away from the palace not to look ridiculous. And that is the last of the changes. Most of the changes happened in 1956. Buxton memorial was removed was moved in 1957 and I think as part of the changes they must have removed those little railings and allowed anyone to walk on the grass so then essentially we have the park as it is now so the gardens are not really an accretion accretion of unplanned changes as has sometimes been suggested in the planning inquiry um, very few subsequent changes have been made apart from changes to the playground and the temporary education centre. But there was one change that nearly happened, or might have happened, um, with a bit of 1960s brutalism coming into the gardens. So Leslie Martin in the mid-1960s was asked to devise a plan for the area around Whitehall. And he aimed to create what he called a government precinct centred on Parliament Square and was obsessed with the idea of giving it a sense of enclosure. So towards the top right there is a, a massive building spanning Whitehall. But to give it a sense of enclosure at the south end, he proposed a great block of buildings going along Great Peter Street and crashing through Victoria Tower Gardens, including both avenues of trees. And he rather naively thought that because he'd um, was putting a road in a tunnel on the river side of the gardens and the Palace of Westminster, which would provide some extra space, people would be happy. Uh, but probably that was defeated both by the cost of the scheme and particularly opposition to the proposed demolition of most of Whitehall. So nothing happened. So for the last 50 years or so, there hasn't been much history to record in Victoria Tower Gardens. It's been largely free from threat, except occasional encroachments from uh, Parliament itself. There are some um, pictures, most of which I found on Flickr. Um, at the top right hand one is among a group of excellent pictures taken by Patricia Stoughton. And it shows really what we're hoping to save um, in the current planning inquiry. And of course, the halcyon period of nothing changing has now come to an end. And my last picture is also taken from Flickr. 
and the end means it's the end of my talk, hopefully not the end of the gardens, but um, thank you. And obviously I'm very willing to take questions. There it is. Oh, that's a lovely picture. It is. If anybody would like to ask a question, any questions, could they put their hand up? Yes, Chris Dawes, could you unmute yourself, Chris? I think I have. Lovely. Uh, I think I have unmuted myself. Yes, you have. You have. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, I thought that was a, a wonderful talk and um, it uh, gives even more uh, power to the arguments that, um, uh, for saving Victoria Tower Gardens from a, in my view, rather bombastic um, uh, domination by a single monument, which is not uh, in line with the history that you have um, explained. Um, I had a, a couple of particular questions. One is, that was a wonderful picture by Canaletto. Where mm. can we see it? And the second was, um, W. H. Smith had this, um, uh, what one might describe as a covenant on the gardens. And is there some legal route mm. which we haven't yet explored uh, beyond judicial review and the planning inquiry? to prevent the destruction of the gardens. Thanks. The Canaletto picture exists in a number of different versions. There are some in this country. The, the one I've used actually came through the Bridgman Art Library and it's one somewhere in Prague. Um, uh, it, it seemed to be the clearest um, and wasn't too expensive to, to use. I think the Bank of England may have one. If you Google it, um, a number of different versions turn up. Um, the W. H. Smith, his, the promise to him really applied to the original part of the gardens, which is what he paid part of the money for, for laying out. But it was because of that promise that the provision was written into the 1900 Act that the new land between the altered mill bank and the river should remain a garden open to the public. Um, it's perfectly clear that the department for um, culture, media and sport, which owns it, had absolutely no idea why it owned it and what conditions stopped it being used for something different. Um, but if it needs to be challenged, um, the, that, rem that will be something in the future. It hasn't been done yet, except that a letter has been sent and the government pride and said, oh, there's no problem. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question? Uh, we have Mark has raised his hand. Okay, we'll just unmute you, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, it's not so much a question, but I just wanted to say how delighted I was with the talk and with the wonderful images, which I haven't uh, seen in, even in our own research. And we've had a lot of files out from the Public Records Office at Kew over, over many years. So mm. absolutely delighted. And I really hadn't realised how busy those wolves were. And I thought that was fascinating. Mm. And the way you recounted the history was. Um, one of the interesting uh, things I did hear, and perhaps you could confirm it, was uh, when the sand pit was built, apparently it had to go to the far end of the garden because of the incessant noise of the children would disturb those at their business within the Palace of Westminster. <laughs> uh, they certainly wanted to keep the children at the south end um, and occasionally there's some worry about the Lord Great Chamberlain being worried at the other end by noise. At one, at one point I think in the 1930s, they asked, what well, do we need Black Rod's Garden at all? Could we extend Victoria Tower Gardens uh, right up to the walls of the palace? Um, uh, they decided not to. Um, it's not terribly clear in the files, why not? Um, incidentally, one of the, one of the pictures, um, in fact, the one showing Victoria Tower Gardens around about 1910, which is the best I've seen of the original gardens, I found, in fact, 
unfortunately after writing the book, um, on your Twitter feed, the Society's Twitter feed. Um, so there are probably more to be discovered. The mm. one of the one from uh, the southern part of Millbank, looking north, um, turned up in New South Wales, not found by me in that case. So these these things will carry on turning up, I think. I saw. Uh, it, it, uh, could I just say one more thing? It does does strike me though, also seeing the uh, trees uh, shortly after they've been planted, how open a garden it was and mm. how much the development of the trees has, I suppose, altered the gardens in some way. And I think people can view that in different ways and whether uh, as horticulturists, we should have started shaping the trees and keeping them in, in, in some sort of uh, uniform um, condition and growth habits um, to allow them, uh, dominating as some might say has happened at the moment. I'm not criticizing it but for me as a horticulturist it just shows that perhaps we should have intervened at a much earlier time in the in the life of the trees to keep the the gardens um, as I think they were initially intended. Mm, interesting. Um, I saw that Graham had his hand up. Yes, um, uh, thank you Jules. Uh, thank you Dorian. A uh, fascinating talk. Um, just to add a piece of just trivia, really. You mentioned a strange man crossing Parliament Square in front of the Buxton Memorial. Mm. Um, that strange man um, was Cecil Parker, the actor, because what you're showing is a still oh. or a screen grab of the film Dear Mr. Prohack, 1949, which is on YouTube. Just <laughs> type in Dear Mr. Prohack. And you'll get pick the the scene where he crosses Parliament Square, um, or crosses um, towards the Treasury Building. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting is it shows that the Buxton Memorial was much closer to where Churchill is now uh, than would be suggested by the uh, stone in Parliament Square, which is a sort of memorial to the Buxton Memorial, uh, which is up near, much nearer to Canning Green. Um, but that, the, the film is, I mean, the film is rather tedious, but it's right. worth having a look at. I'm glad to have that Small explained. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. There must be better pictures of it, but I haven't seen any yet. Yeah, yeah I haven't. I'd love to. So yeah. yeah. Um, anybody else? Oh, Victor. Victor, the Thorny Island Twitter feed. We have to un... There we go, Victor. No, he must start again. I was going to ask. Well done. Arising, you mentioned the. Did you mention the word shelter at Black Black Rod's Garden, that building that just goes on the, on the edge of the river? Do you know anything more about that? Because it's always puzzled me a bit. Because it's got stairs going down, as if it was a, a main entrance. <laughs> What I was talking about actually was at the other end oh. in um, Abingdon Street. It's, I think it's originally a police shelter. So where you would go into the Palace of Westminster, on the left you've got the Victoria Tower itself, and on the right you've got this shelter, uh, which marks the edge of the land that was purchased in 18, uh, under the 1837 Act, uh, beyond which was Little Abingdon Street. 